Thomas. Thomas, thank you so much for doing a studio visit. Thank you so much. Uh, are you in your studio or are you at home? Uh, I'm in my studio at the moment. Yes, here in Berlin. And he's and eight o'clock, something like this. I hear sometimes up to 75 people work in the studio. Did you change this during these times? Is it, is it fewer people? Is it different right now? More or less, uh, we are the same team, uh, thanks also to the German government, which, uh, you know, have supported a lot of, of almost all artists. And this means they, there is something which is called uh, Kurzarbeit. And this means what they do, they, they, you know, they, in the times that where there is no job or, you know, exhibition have been postponed or delayed, uh, you know, they, they support the uh, salaries of, of the people up to, in some cases, up to 80% of the original salary. This means, uh, luckily, yeah, uh, we are, uh, you know, the studio uh, at the moment is, yeah, it, there is uh, less activities, but, uh, but luckily all the people who have been working here, you know, are protected by, by the German government. That's right, uh, that's right. We started these studio visits, Thomas, when LA got, started safer at home, how we call the lockdown in March. And then of course, several areas of the world had a more or less regular summer. And we stayed, stayed in, a, in a safer at home, uh, gradually more safe than, than before, but not really, it was never really opened up completely. So for example, the museum closed in March and the, still the county has to release gives the permission for us to reopen. So, so now looking at Europe closing again, you in summer had several exhibitions. You actually were quite active this year in Italy, in Berlin, and we look at the exhibitions. But I would like to ask you a couple of things, um, like how it all started, how you became an artist. Are your parents artists? No, uh, my... My mother studied biology and my father agriculture, and uh, and my mother more concentrated in in, in plants, his botanist, and and then my father more in kind of um, agriculture, and uh, and I'm uh, I think so. Being an artist is also not knowing what art is, and 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 is mean is always in a in a constant uh, mood of, of of learning, right? Uh, and, and this mean uh, I don't know. Sometimes when when people uh, you know ask me in, in the museum, um, are you a student? Uh, I I think so. I always say yes, uh, student for life. Has been what I think so. Art is uh, at least for my understanding is is a place you know in which somehow allows you to all the time uh, you know be curious and and being in a state of of of, uh, of not knowing and knowing right and both at the same time but with a great equilibrium. Does it mean uh, I'm an artist, but you know, I think so. Um, maybe many other things also, who knows? Maybe I'm a spider in another world, in another time, you know. Thomas, first you studied, you were born in Argentina and you will talk a little bit about your childhood at some point, but you started studying back in Argentina and you started at the Bellas Artists, you started at the university in Buenos Aires, you started, you studied architecture, right? Uh, yes, uh, I study architecture. Uh, I completed the, the career of architecture in Buenos Aires, and then uh, the, the, during the last two years already uh, was Claudio Beckstein, uh, ex students of Seder Schule, where then later I was uh, I was going after my studies in Argentina and Buenos Aires, and this means that the last year was, uh, you know, I was frequenting kind of a was an art school. This uh, this institution and uh, I was getting in contact more and more with, with artists. And this means when I went to study, I studied with uh, Peter Cook. Uh, at that time, he was at the school. Uh, uh, the prof because I arrived also in the middle of the semester, it was kind of a misunderstanding with the date. And then, uh, some, and, and then Thomas Barley was the one who accepted to the school. And then Daniel Birbon arrived also. And uh, I don't know, it was, uh, it was always, um, a great mix between disciplines, let's put it that way. And then from there also, in one moment, I, because I applied for many grants, uh, I got invited to uh, Italy, to the UAP, where there I met, uh, you know, Hans-Rick Aubrey, Solafur Eliasson, uh, Rick Ritchie and, 
and many other friends. And then Olaf would invite me to, to come and work at his studio in Berlin. And, uh, you know, and I start to connect, get more and more uh, in, in connection with, uh, with artists and, and creators. And, and then Olaf would introduce me, Tanya, which is here today also. And I mean, you know, I have been always... Uh, and, Thomas, and what, I, what I always, from the very beginning, and we know each other now like 15 years or so, mid 2000s, yeah, like 15 years, um, that you have an in incredible way of, of uh, associating so freely that there's no chronology, <laughs> which I love. And that's the first studio visit I do that is not <laughs> chronologically ordered. But, but let's, let's, let's begin with childhood. There are these beautiful pictures and I'm very grateful that you found those for us. There's three pictures. Can you tell us what we see on the three pictures? Yes. It was all my family looking for a picture because I said I had to do an interview. And Klaus asked me for a very old picture. And, you know, I was actually my mother had sent them, to, uh, them from Argentina, and I, I'm the one on on the right, uh, and my brother is on the left. But yeah, the pictures are when I was in uh, living in Italy. I was born in Argentina, and uh, and when I was one year old, my family um, uh, have moved. Oh, um, to Italy, uh, actually, you know, they had been forced to move to to um, to Italy because it was the time of dictatorship. Uh, more than thirty thousand people have disappeared uh, due to uh, yeah, non-democratic uh, government, a dictatorship government. And luckily, my father uh, had an Italian passport. Oh. Has been, uh, he was, uh, uh, you know, all family have been uh, forced to move to to Italy, and we were living in exile. Well, well, I was just born, right? Uh, and then I was living in Italy uh, from one year old to when I was 12 years old. Uh, and then in 83 came back the democratic government and this was allowed for my family to go back to, to Argentina. You know, we were not, not allowing to, to go to the country. And in 86, uh, my family decided to go back and I was at the age of 12. And it's mean, for me it was, uh, you know, when, and, and you know, I, I was always, I, I, I would speak Spanish but I don't know how to write Spanish. I mean, it's almost what you speak, what you write, but, but somehow it was, um, I don't know, you know, now down the roads and, and with the years, uh, uh, I think so I've shaped somehow uh, uh, also my artwork, right? And, and, and the way when people ask me. What do you consider your native language? Uh, you know, I, I sometimes people will ask me, you know, I say, where are you come from? And I say, from the planet Earth, right? <laughs> You know, I, I always have a little bit to say, you know, suffer a little bit, you know, when you are a child and they will ask you, where are you, where you come from? And then, you know, when I was in Italy, we'll say, well, but you are an Argentinian, you know, a, a South American. And we will be in Argentina, people will say, but you are Italian. And this means when now a world uh, football matches, you know, which, which I really don't care much, but I always was from the wrong country, let's push it that way, right? And tell, us mean, a little bit, tell us a little bit about your first, your first thoughts or images that now looking back remind you that that might have been an early idea of your work. That was an interesting sentence. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, it, was, it was a great exercise. I mean, I, what, what I remember, I mean, and the two pictures on the left are uh, uh, part of the house where my family uh, and what I was living with my family in Italy. And what I remember always was going up to the attic, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, was not uh, remodelated. It was, I mean, it was, was always kind of uh, inhabited by, by maybe others. And then I always remember to, to be up there and then um, to observe through the windows, uh, this kind of um, uh, dust coming through the windows. Uh, and at the same time, a lot of spider webs uh, were living up into the into the attic, and that's something which I, I don't know. It keep reminding me. I have a, a very old uh, um, school uh, friend uh, who the father was an astronomer also, and I remember also you know going uh, uh, watch uh, the stars with the telescopes, and then going back and uh, and then I don't know. I, this is kind of the, the, the impression you know me going up to the to the roof of this house and and be quiet and, and see these. Uh, this house in, maybe inhabited by others, you know what I mean? And this somehow maybe, you know, it's still up to today, these two images are something which is 
quite pressing in my work. Uh, yeah, where the spiders living with you or are you living with the spiders? And exactly. when I explained your work very early on, when I made an, a bigger acquisition, I said like, oh, you never know whether it's microscopic or it's a telescope. You never know it's monumental or tiny, tiny. Let's go to the next slide, perhaps. Your studio and yourself, you provided us with a visual atlas. This is a video. <laughs> What are we looking at, Thomas? What are we looking at? We, if we are very, very paying attention, we might see something. Yeah. Well, a, a little bit close, yes, is because for me also, you know, some things with the image, and this is a video, I don't know if you, some of you see, but there are some, some small, very small particles, which are this, you know, primordial dust, let's say, from my childhood, right? Yeah. Which is a, this kind of a piece, which actually now is shown in Palazzo Strozzi. Uh, and then what it does is kind of a, a, is a live streaming of a dust which is floating in the room of the exhibition in Florence, in, in Italy. And in the back, there is a kind of another type of, of dust, which is a kind of a, a pictures of a large megalanic cloud. Has been what it does is kind of overlap these two temporalities. And this is why I thought, you know, just yeah. to confuse a little bit, you know, the time of my childhood and the time of today, right? It's a time, you know, that when you see the dust coming through the wind and you see the windows and the shutters are closed and you start to imagine, you know, uh, what is in the air, right? And what is the presence, you know, we, we might all kind of uh, be breathing today. And at the same time, you know, it, this is kind of, a, I, you know, I, I argue that this is kind of a movie. And the movie, the length of this movie, of the, the movie of the back is 163,000 uh, long movie. I mean, it's a movie which is very, very, very long. I, I, uh, is 163,000 uh, years long, uh, which is the time uh, for the large megalanic, megalanic cloud, the cloud that you see here on the left, is the time that the light it take to travel from that distance uh, to the earth. And this means by the time that you might be watching the end of the movie, maybe uh, that cloud, that constellation might not exist anymore. And this means it's kind of merging these two time of, of you know, at the same time that when you try to look at, at many, you know, um, objects that are in the sky, they might not exist anymore. It's just light traveling to us. I mean, it's kind of the, you're kind of condemned to watch the past, right? And, and how much the past also, maybe in personal history, it plays a role. And I mean, you know, these two moments is, uh, is why it's maybe, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to be chronological for who and, 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 and you know. And, and oh, that's a living... That's definitely the living proof of your associative chronology. You have the star, you have the dust in the exhibition space superimposed with the stellar constellation and this zooming yeah. in and zooming out. This yeah. next picture has, and perhaps let's everybody have a look at the spider and we go to the next picture. Yeah. Yeah. And does it mean, you know, in, in that stage, you know, you know, when, when I think about like making a movie which is 163,000 uh, years long, uh, the question is like, who, who will be able to watch that movie? I show one slide, one frame per, per year. Uh, and this means the, the, you know, the question sometimes you could ask is, uh, you, know, you know, who will be around? by that time, you know, still human will be here on the planet Earth. And it's mean a little bit what, what, what is sometimes is asking about, uh, you know, the capacity of, 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 of have been learning to know how to live on a planet, you know, and sometimes, uh, you know, when you talk with biologists, they, they said, look, uh, for example, spiders have been living on the planet Earth for almost 200 million years, uh, and humans only 300,000 years a third of a million of a year, right? A third, a third of, a, of a million of a year. And, and somehow, and, 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 and people said, usually if you know how to survive on a planet, you should live minimum for two million, two million years. This means at that extent, you know, I think the spiders are much more keen to be able to see the end of that movie or to see if the large melagonalic cloud is still there. Uh, and, and I don't know if, if uh, if humans are some human keep the, the relationship that they have with the planet as today, I think so, uh, they will tend to disappear with, when we face this uh, mass extinction and the, and the rate of, of destruction. But, that we but, have you, but you also, what is so interesting in your work is 
not only the zooming in and zooming out and here the drops in the spider web, the very last picture are gigantic spheres in the sky above the huge, above New York City basically. And I think it's so beautiful to have this image, the miniature, and it has the same logic or the same forces of nature and gravity and lightness and geometry, architecture as it. You're also a very planetary observer. If we go to the next image, that was the first time you and I worked with each other, 2006. This is difficult to see what are we actually seeing, which is so an important question in your work, Thomas, always is about noticing and trying to understand what we are actually looking at. And if yeah. we go to the next slide, which I think is a video, and it has no sound. So please explain to us what we're looking at. This is so monumental. When I bought it for the museum, we could never <laughs> install it because it, it's like a museum by itself. What are we looking at, Thomas? Yeah, to, uh, yeah two, two things also, because I play a lot with this, this possibility of seeing and not seeing. This, I mean, that piece was installed, I mean, uh, installed at the Barbican, just only, and the Barbican is a very, very long curve. Curve is almost 100 meter long. And one of the things also is, I was thinking, well, it would be very interesting to see a movie that, that you, will, you cannot see it all at the, at the same time, right? Is what you see now on the screen. And it's been your body, you know, need to move around the corner to be able, what happened in the other part of, 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 of the movie. And it's been, you know, and also when we think about, uh, you know, for me, it will be quite of a, a struggle to think about uh, what are we seeing because. I'm always trying to try to think about uh, how others could see, and in this case, not only human. This I mean, let's remember that the spiders weave webs. They're almost blind. They don't see. And they perceive the world through vib vibration, right? And it's I mean, all the time when I, when I try to think is like how sometimes the question, maybe I thought like, a, uh, what do you feel, right? And, and, uh, and sometimes it's a lot not about to see, but of perceiving things in, in different scale, or different, as you said, you know, from the microscopy to the micro. Has been, Thomas, may I give a visual clue of what we're actually looking at? This is a very, very large panoramic multi-channel video projection. So you have one projector and then another projector, another. So you have these 100 meters, 300 feet that the Barbican has a long curve. And what you did is you created this 360 nearly degree panoramic view of the weather and the sky reflected in one of these high altitude salt lakes. Yeah. So yeah, the beautiful. salt lake has like a mirror smooth surface like glass. And so everything that happens atmospherically, weather wise, the clouds, the time passing reflects in this perfect symmetry. If we go back one slide and you have the whole day, so you're capturing time. Yeah. You're also yeah. capturing yeah, and there are these beautiful moments also where, where, where when, when, you know, uh, when, when really the horizon disappear, right? Has I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's quite magic, you know, it's kind of really reflect uh, what is up is down and what down is up. And then you, you get this feeling of, of being really disoriented, right? It's like, a, you know, if, <laughs> when we think about being, uh, you know, uh, in Mars in, in, in the universe or, or kind of a cosmic web, uh, you know, this is one really of my favorite places on earth. You know, it's really like a, amazing. What is really amazing also is like a, a and, and by chance I discovered also what it happened at night. You know, all the stars also, as, as they reflect the clouds, also at night, it reflects all the stars. And when you step, you, you really step on, on the stars and then all the ripples uh, of space time kind of really is something which is quite an amazing experience. And then, yeah, it had been always, something which is in my mind and you know is a place where usually I, I go back and back and back uh, through the years there is some uh, yeah, addiction to these uh, kind of landscapes. You have these tendencies that you look for nature where nature nearly becomes a zero or a flatness or a perfection that you normally only achieve in mathematics or in architecture. This is a completely smooth surface that perhaps otherwise you would only find in a piece of glass or in a piece of something in industrially 
fabricated in a way. And the desert, the salt lakes, the sky, the clouds, the, uh, the stellar constellations. Let's go to the next one because this also is as microscopic as it is galactic. And it's mm. called galaxies forming along filaments like droplets along the strands of a spider's web. That was a real revelation for me walking into the main hall of the Venice Biennial in 2009. Uh, Making Worlds was the title of the Biennial. And this was an absolutely... I look at sculpture, I always walk around sculpture. I want to know how, what the weight of a sculpture is. I want to know how much time I need to walk around it. And, how big it is in relation. And if we go to the next slide, it looks like we're jumping, but we're not jumping. <laughs> and we go to the next slide. Explain a little bit what we are looking at here. And then we come back to the thought we are not losing right now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's good. And thank you for, for yeah, being flexible on, on on, on trying to think how my brain <laughs> works. But basically, yes, this is a, 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 a MRI, a com a computer tomography. Uh, we are in a hospital in, um, in Frankfurt at the time when I was living there. And we are trying to scan a, a, a three-dimensional spider web. I was quite uh, obsessed about the idea of, of, of how these very intricate webs, uh, which are not the, the, usually the flat ones, which are kind of these orb, uh, orb uh, weave uh, constellation, but are kind of these much more complicated. And then, you know, I, I start to, to research and uh, try to ask, uh, you know, many arachnologists that uh, I start to get in contact with the uh, Senckenberg Museum in Frankfurt with Peter Jäger, which is in one of the photos on the right. I'm trying to think if, if they might be possible to reconstruct this world. And then I find out that, you know, after many experiments of trying to scan these, uh, these webs, uh, they, 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 were, they was never done and there was no machine even who will be able to scan it. I mean, one of the, the, the curiosity was also, I tried to think about, um, you know, I was reading many articles at the time that uh, the origin of the universe right after the Big Bang, what, what they call the cosmic web, uh, it resembled pretty much of the analogy that the uh, astronomers will find is uh, when they will talk is it is kind of uh, 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 drops of water along strands of spider web. And I mean, you know, I, with the curiosity of trying to understand where we live, how we live in this planet in relation with other planets, uh, you know, I was quite uh, obsessed of trying to understand a new universe that sometimes we neglected in our spider, because spiders sometimes I consider really like a pest. <laughs> and I mean, you know, sometimes people ask say also, like we know more about uh, outer space uh, than what is happening in the oceans today, right? And I mean, it's, it, you know, try to find these two analogies and try to put these two worlds together uh, into try to to understand and basically then we we, we found a solution to scan these webs and then I and work my work is one. we are looking at this is the proof of your success that you did scan the pi first time ever scan a spider web here 14 yeah. billions why is it called 14 billion billions well, Thomas well, because they said this is the age of the universe right after the big bang is 13.714 you know the, the, the time it's kind of uh, quite uh, shifting yet, but uh, but yeah, I mean, w what it happened then later is was really this idea of uh, of sharing this knowledge. You know, many of the work it's, it work through open source to collaborate with scientists and, and to university and institution, and then to try to yeah uh, to share that knowledge in, in in the best ways possible. And then you know we we have also uh, yeah contributed I think so hopefully as much into art also into the science, you know, and I, I've been invited many times and, and we pay, published also many papers with MIT, with the Max Planck Institute. And we have, uh, yeah, uh, published twice Nature Magazine also for the ones who are in science. It's quite rewarding also that. And you worked with, with, NAS with NASA in, a, in, in one collaboration. So we first looked at the, at the galaxies like bubbles along a spider web. That was the first image. We saw the science publication. We saw you tomography, cat scanning uh, the spider web and the successfully remade spider web. How do you go about making these works? Like 14 billion. So if we go one slide back, we said that is the successfully scanned. How do you then make this an object? 
in three-dimensional space in time of the exhibition duration? Uh, well, it is a, is a quite complicated because all these nodes in space, in, uh, you know, they, they, for example, what is quite complicated is like when, you know, it's to, it's to find exactly the position of this uh, intersection of all these ropes in space uh, and being able to, to keep them knowing that uh, the tension of the last rope you should have. Because, I mean, usually it's something, you know, when you pull one rope, one node, you know the position of it, but with it bifurcated in two and in three and in four and in many of the nodes which are there, it's quite complicated to know that the tension that you have to have in that rope. It's been, you know, it's a little bit about this uh, dependency of, 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 you know, the position of, of each of these lines and the tension that each of them need to have uh, to keep uh, in place that, uh, that geometry. It's been, you know, it's a kind of an exercise which is required a lot of patience and, and a lot of precision to a certain extent. Uh, but then, you know, it, it have a kind of a, a special beauty that it seems that uh, it could not have been done maybe by humans, you know, to a certain extent. This is called Algorithms and the Palais de Tokyo in Paris, a gigantic contemporary art space that we all love, uh, does carte blanche. Carte blanche is the whole museum goes to one artist and you can basically have a, a grand scheme, a master plan. You can invite other artists, you can leave the museum empty, and you worked on an exhibition called On Air, which was in 2018. It was very much about, about sound and about defining the volume, also volume as in spatial volume and sound volume of the interior of the Palais. We just looked at the uh, more spiderweb-like filling of space, spatial definition of the gallery. This is called algorithms. Is this based on a different, on a different uh, idea of how to, how to space out your sculpture? Uh, well, basically it retakes part of the exhibition which was 2009 in Venice, which won actually one of the first was also at the Tanya Bonarca Gallery in New York. And it's been, you know, some of the work it keep, uh, repeating and keep adding layers, you know what I mean? And in this case, when, when we did the show at, at Palais de Tokyo, one of the things which I was always interested in is think about, uh, you know, how these, uh, these strings uh, in K, you know, in the, if the possibility might exist, uh, that they will turn into sonic uh, vibration. So what it happened that every time to touch one of the string, it turned this piece in kind of a, a big uh, musical instrument who could play simul be played simultaneously by many people. And, and you know, and, and we, because each string is connected to a piezo microphone, a very sensitive microphone, and it played a sound. And this means there are many, many sounds that are a whole variety of sound for each string, so it produce a different sound. And it was the idea, you know, to, to and, but not only that, it's like a, that is played by, by human interaction, but also was played by spider which were living at Palais de Tokyo. And one of the things that we, we find out also is, is recognize the, the, the presence of, of other beings being much before than us, like spider living on the planet Earth or living also at Palais de Tokyo. And so what we do, we, we kind of amplify their vibration. When, uh, when the spiders will be play their own web in the different floors on the basement of the Palais de Tokyo, all the floor of this exhibition, it, it will be vibrate. There are a, a lot of shakers, which are kind of vibrate a very low frequency. And so what you will be trying is trying to play at the rhythm uh, of other species also. That's amazing, that's amazing. Let's go to the next slide. You may. Oops. So that's only to give, you are using certain um, motifs, so to say. So the motif of the net, the motif of the, um, the balloon, the bubble, the, the inflatable geometrical shapes, Buckminster Fuller inspired uh, shapes, you're using these throughout your career. And you, you do this, it's like a theme with variations, and, but also a larger development. So this is a work that was at Palais de Tokyo, but we look at it in the logic of the A chronological. We look later, we look at an earlier version of this. Let's go to the next one. 
And this is such an important body of work. I could spend like a whole evening talking about it, but do you Thank want you. So how I understand it, you have a whole space in your studio where spiders, you have these like metal cubes and spiders have the freedom to spin their webs and different kind of spiders have different kind of traditions, instincts to have a different architectural pattern they're gonna produce, reproduce. Do you wanna talk a little bit about what we are looking at and how this is brought into life and then brought into art? Yes, yes no, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm always uh, yeah, curious to, for example, in the image on the, yeah, on the right, and I think it's similar on the image on the left is the same piece or a bit more close up, is uh, the bottom is a Nephila senegalensis spider web, which is a solitary spider. Uh, is a type of, type of spider that usually live alone in one single web, and is more orbicular. This mean have this kind of, uh, uh, um, you know, rays coming to a concentric uh, point, and, and she lives there. And then the other is a, is a Citophora citricola, is another type of spider who is a semi-social colony of spiders. Has been what, what is happening in these spaces are the two type of two or three or more uh, species of spider who weave webs uh, together. Has been each of them, they have still a recognized signature or a type of pattern, but I'm very much interesting, you know, on the moment that one spider starts to weave a web on top of the other web and how more or less also it recognizes its own web through the web of another uh, species of spider. And this means they are sometimes merging from color, from geometries, and you know, it's all this type of, uh, and, and then we do a lot of uh, amplification of that web. We have very sensitive microphones, and sometimes it's about, you know, uh, being able to perceive the world. Now, all these spiders, usually, they do not see this web. This means the way of orientating to perceive the world is really through vibration. And I mean, I'm quite, a, uh, you know, in, in many of the works then, it come, uh, I, what I call it is not sound, this is why when we try to amplify that vibration, we amplify with a very low frequency, you know, you don't, you don't hear an uh, earthquake, you feel an earthquake when the, when the, you know, when the, when the earth trembles. This means our frequency which are very, very low in range, but still produce, you know, something that you can, you can feel uh, in your body, right? Has been and, and the web somehow are this kind of um, embodiment of, of, of the web, of the world of the spider. I mean, are consider or we consider together with other scientists that the spider web is part of the body of the spider. It's kind of the offloading of the brain. No, is 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 out there and with it it kind of perceive the world. Yeah, it's enfolding basically is the work of the spider. Yeah, there are spiders, Klaus, for example, that if they are not able to weave the web and and you, you know, you, if there is a mosquito, a cricket next to them, they will not eat. This means the web until they don't weave the web, which is kind of weaving your own mouth, they will not be able to eat and they will, you know, uh, they will not eat. And this means it's really, you have to, we have to think about that. The web is somehow the extension of their own body. It's the way that they can sense, you know, uh, others also. Yeah, it's like growing hair nearly, which is also part of your body and comes like metabol yeah. from metabolism out of the body. Which, which is today, you know, all the time, this, the analogy will be to think about, uh, you know, humans decoupled from the planet Earth, right? It's like we think that we could be self-sufficient without, uh, you know, the dependency and the coexistence of many species. This means, you know, somehow also, you know, is this kind of, uh, you know, today kind of rethink about a connection to, uh, that, uh, that we all depend on, right? I love the title. That was the installation view at an exhibition at the Louvre in Paris. So you're exhibiting at the Louvre in Paris in an exhibition called A Brief History of the Future. A Brief History of the Future. May I ask a practical question? These are so fragile. And in the museum context, and a museum always thinks about how do you preserve a work of art. Are these actually, what is their life expectancy? Well, we, we, you know, it, the spider web is one of the strongest material you can find on earth, you know, you know, it's, it's really kind of, uh, it's very, very, very resilient. And, you know, look, some of these web, we already have them for 
almost 15, 16 years and are preserved in a perfect state. And when we asked many arachnologists also how long they will last also, and they said they believed they could last thousands of years. And does it mean, um, you know, if they are, they are preserving kind of uh, uh, in good condition, you know, what, and one of the proof of this is uh, when you find spider webs inside caves. Caves, uh, natural caves, are one of the, the spaces where the uh, variation of temperature is, 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 is not so much. And this means you could find spider webs inside caves which are, you know, for, for, for thousands of years old. And I mean, uh, this kind of, uh, we, we believe that, you know, if they are well preserved in a museum condition or cave condition, uh, they will last for a very, very long time. Oh, that's amazing. Let's go to the next image, which for me, when you talked about elasticity and how long and durable material is, Knowing your work, I knew that you had done your math and your architecture because I went up there and you're basically 75 feet, 25 meters up in the air at K21 in Dusseldorf and you walk on that spider web with 75 feet below you and you can hang out in these bubbles. And when I first saw it, because I think this is also the museum made a bravo to the museum that they got all the permits and everything and first it was only thought of as a as an exhibition and they made it kind of a permanent installation in Dusseldorf right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. No, it's true. how did this exhibition come about you just at some point woke up and I thought I will I will <laughs> change this museum forever or how did no. that happen no, the intention was yeah just to do an exhibition for over six months I think so from three to six months and then was uh, I think so quite successful and became kind of a, a landmark also you know what I mean that people will really uh, fall in love with with the work and uh, and also I think so it's a quite a, a complicated space for other artists to think about uh, other artworks it's been, but also because it attract a lot of people <laughs> I think so there was uh, for half a year they have to refurbish and I think so 50 percent of all the tickets uh, went down in the museum. This mean immediately the, the, the museum and the government find a way to refurbish the piece and then, you know, it came back again. And now I kind of, it, it, yeah, I don't know how long we'd stay, but I'm very happy that the piece is there and people are enjoying it quite a much. Yeah, and it's also seven, like- It's there for seven years. If already, that's incredible, congratulations. If we go one slide further, Thomas, because I think this is a year earlier for me, kind of a predecessor of the Dusseldorf piece, which couldn't be forever. The Hunger Bicocca in Milano, it's a, it's a square space. It's, it's actually a vertical, it's a vertical uh, cube, rectangular cube. And sorry if I'm not, my architectural idioms are not exactly correct here, not, not correctly describing it. But what you did is you, in the first drawing we see, you created, a system of membranes very high up and there's a layer of membranes and of course when you walk onto these membranes that also great work of architecture never failed nobody was hurt in this this okay. art exhibition here but of course your own weight influences how deep this membrane lowers itself in relation to the other audience members being on the membrane. I think that was a groundbreaking piece of, of visualizing the membrane, the risk, the interaction, the web-like quality of this. Do you want to talk a little bit about yeah. when you look back at this groundbreaking work and we yeah. see it from the drawing to the action? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's, it's, it's beautiful. And, and, and many of the things, it, it's, uh, it's true, you know, but uh, for example, one of the elements for me, which it was, was very, very present here is the air, right? Uh, and how much, uh, you know, the different pressure of air, the different volume of air, of air uh, somehow also allow, uh, uh, you know, a certain geometry to be shift according also to the specific body and the position of the people who, who, who you know, move within it. It's been, um, uh, for me, it was quite of a, uh, you know, 
interesting about uh, the solidarity which somehow emerged when people start to experience that. You know, it's kind of the the distance you should have one to each other. You know, now talking with a with a pandemic, you know, is something which which it, it completely take another significant uh, you know uh, meaning because somehow. What is happened, usually you learn quite soon that if two bodies get very close, they bend the space and then they go really down. And then if somebody was in nearby, they always will fall in this kind of social black hole, let's put it that way, right? And then it was very, very, you have, you know, tried to spiral up like the same, like galaxies will move out and then to try to distribute the load again into the other. But you don't depend also only on the movement of the people, of the one meter fifty now, or everybody, will understand it, but but also on how people move in the upper level. And it's been sometimes, you know, it was quite of a challenge to try to let the health and safety and all the security and insurance try to, to make them understand that, uh, you know, we should really hopefully rely on human behavior and we should have trust. And based on that trust also, we managed to do the insurance and then to the peace. But what is, is quite difficult and when you think about uh, how much you know the space it could change in relationship with the with the movement of the people and the responsibility that you have to have uh, in them also to to you know to to behave in certain ways that everybody will not be squeezed about the different layers. Anyway, when when people learn about all this ecosystem uh, uh, you know ecosystem and this kind of relationship of codependency one to each other, it happened also when people open the door in any of the level, all the air is start to flow. And then it's again start to collapse and the geometry is kind of, it seems global warming, climate change is entering into the room that you have to learn a whole set of rules of behave and, and being different one to each other. I mean, for me it's, it's all the time this kind of um, somehow, uh, um, you know, deal with sometimes with this fear, you know, uh, sometimes with arachnophobia, sometimes with a fear of height, sometimes with, and to try to confront yourself and also at the same time, uh, it, you know, what was very beautiful in K21 is people when they would start to enter in that and they, they kind of, they are at the edge of the cliff, you know, they are like, oh my God. And then what is happening is like other people go there and usually give them a hand and, and one start to help each other. Has been this solidarity that is, you know, it happened by experience. The peace is something which, you know, I, I deeply love. You know what I mean? Is this kind of, uh, you know, because at the beginning you are a little bit kind of afraid of, and and, and I, I think so. It's, it's, I, I I enjoy that. For me, Thomas, from the very beginning, you are also a sculptor that visualizes fragility, because that's something very rare. Sculpture is often very solid and bronze and steel and heavy. But the fragility of your sculpture for me was always a, a very important factor. And the fragility also lends itself to going to something that you can't see, like sound. We go to the next image, go to the next image. And this is actually a sound installation. And Thomas, before we start the video, our group from MoCA, we visited the, uh, we visited the Venice Biennale and we went on a day where I think we were not really allowed to go closer to your sculpture. And it was an incredible, you say, group inspiring, group dynamics. So we took each other's hand and we made it to see and experience <laughs> and hear your piece. It was a wonderful experience. Let's, let's, let's listen to the video and please feel free to explain more to us, Thomas. <laughs> Yeah, what, what you hear is a, a, a variation. I mean, in, in Venice, uh, there is an, a 16 siren spread through the peninsula uh, that uh, plays a, a certain siren, a certain tones of music to, uh, to tell the population of Venice when will be aqua alta, when the, when the sea level rise, it, it goes up. And they have a tone for when it grows to 30 centimeters, 60 centimeters, one meter, and so on. Has been, uh, what we did is kind of a play that, uh, that music, take that silence that they are used to, to tell when the, the sea level rising will play and speculate what will happen in 100 years. 
has been, we start to, you know, was quite fascinating. People, local people from Venice, when they hear that sound, they say, oh my God, the water level is going up, right? And they will start to rush to their home because they know they have to prevent themselves because, you know, the, the, the flooding will come. But, you know, after a while, you understand that that was a variation and then the tone will go up and will go much more weird. And this, I mean, we play with the idea, you know, it's like, a, what will be the sirens that the world will need to hear in 100 years with the sea level rise with war, we will rise in almost, you know, everywhere in, in the planet. It's yeah. quite speculative on that. It's amazing. It was also a very beautiful experience. Let's go to the next slide. This is a Grand Cloud City version. One interpretation of this motif here on the roof of the Met. Yeah. You want to talk a bit about this? Yeah, yeah it was, was quite beautiful. Um, I mean, in, in, in Venice also was, on, on, the title was on the disappearance of clouds, which due to anthropocentric clouds, the real clouds that we used to know them are kind of disappearing. And it's been, I play a lot with this uh, idea of, of clouds and, and, and which clouds are, are being present today, which clouds are disappearing uh, from galactic clouds to <laughs> bacteria clouds, let's put it that way. But I mean, what is a small anecdote uh, on that work also for me was very beautiful that uh, there was a, a kind of a, a bird, a falcon, which was living uh, in, in, the, in the Central Park and, 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 uh, and decided to do a, a small nest on top of the sculpture. And it's been all the guards and everybody were fascinated say, look, it looks like the, the bird loved the, the sculpture and was nesting really on the sculpture, it's, you know, besides having spiders and, I mean, for me, that was a, was a beautiful uh, way of, uh, because sometimes you look at a sculpture and you see the park upside down and remind me about all these flying gardens and, and you know, and the idea of, 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 of trying to understand the, our position within the planet, within humans and with, within the universe, right? And, and that was a, so like you know, a fun palace, like a Cedric Price and like mm. the experience to have this urban island because it looks here like you're in a, in a sea of trees. We go for the next one, just in the interest of time. We saw a similar picture, one of these variations at, Saint, at the um, Palais de Tokyo earlier. Uh, what, describe a little bit what we're looking at here on this monumental scale, Thomas. Yeah, well, this is a, a work, we, we call it Museo de Solar, like kind of a flying museum which is, uh, is, is built by, you know, I kind of started and initiated in a conversation with uh, Alberto Pesavento back in 2007. And then, you know, it started to happen in many uh, countries at the same time. Uh, and just with the idea of kind of uh, give a different use or the possibility to reflect on the plastic bags. And this means these are a million of plastic bags that, that people who want to participate and collaborate in the construction of this flying museum are taped together. And then the, what we do, we, we put some air inside and, uh, and then many people make drawings and personal stories. And then when the sun heat up the air, which is in the interior, it just rise uh, into, the, into the, to the sky, to the air. And it's, I mean, it's something which is very, very simple. It's kind of a, we call it do it together uh, sculpture, which uh, it keep traveling in many places around the world. Uh, people also can download instruction over the internet and then they start to build it by themselves. And it's all about trying to rethink about how today we inhabit the air and then try to make a different, uh, you know, experience with the material and, and how we could, uh, we could live differently if we, if we, if we treat the materials and, and we try to, uh, you know, cut this dependency of fossil fuel that we have today. Let's go to the next slide. The end to the next, just for you to tell us a little bit about the age of the air and the age of the carbon-less flight experience. Uh, well, th th then we, we kind of uh, open up a kind of a foundation, you know, the group kind of start to grow in many places around the world. And then uh, people were getting more and more enthusiastic about the idea that we could be with the air in a different way. And then we develop a aerosine backpack. And the aerosine is an era that we call it a, to contrast the Anthropocene where, where humans have a kind of this hegemony over other species and over the climate. And we are trying to think about, uh, you know, how we could take care 
of the air in, in a different way. And you know, one of the way of manifesting is this kind of backpack that you, you could run around, it open, and then you can close it. And then this, when the sun heat up uh, the air, which is in the interior, it just kind of fly up into the air. Has it been based on that speculation, we have done a lot of work uh, and then many people around the world, it kind of tried to think about uh, that, uh, you know, how, how, how we could kind of uh, speculate on, on a different time and different epoch and a different era of, of, of being together with the air. Has it been that the slide which was before was, uh, you know, together with MIT also, we developed something which is called the floating predictor because sometimes it's not so much about flying, but floating at the bottom of ocean of air. And it's kind of a, it, it helps you to calculate how you could move around the world without the use of fossil fuel. And this has been this is another image also that what we what we have been talking about uh, uh, is again in one of the salt lakes in Jujuy, in Argentina. And it, we were working with the communities of uh, people who live there, all the indigenous community, who are suffering a, a lot about the uh, lithium extraction of this area. Uh, you know, Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile is called it triangle of lithium is more than 80% of all the lithium is, uh, is, uh, is you, can, you can find it over there. And the lithium is used for, for the use of uh, cell phone batteries and electric cars and all what is this idea of, of the energetic transition. But what it happened is that uh, you, you need 2 million liters of water to extract one ton of lithium. And in all the people who are living there, which is already are areas which are quite dry, uh, are suffering a lot from this method of extraction. And currently there is not really another economical method of extraction. This means they oppose themselves quite strongly against um, the, this mode of extraction and this mode of, of uh, you know, um, having this violence on the territory. So animals and plants and all the mode of life that they have been living uh, kind of uh, will be extinct. And this means we work together with them on trying to also, and, and with them they wrote this beautiful message that the water and life uh, is worth than lithium. And, and, you know, we celebrate also maybe different ways of how we can work together and participate together on trying to, uh, how we could live differently on this planet. I'm also amazed and I want to emphasize this now and I hope I did it before. You also finding form, you always have a message, you always have a, a research process, but you're also finding form in a way that I think I sometimes think about like truth and beauty, and this is definitely a very, very beautiful project and how you um, composed it, so to say. I would, I would like to show a minute of a video. It's, a, it's an excerpt of a much longer work you did. Let's, let's just absorb it and listen to it. And it also has a beautiful, loud soundtrack. Thank you. La época de Aerosen. Just to state the obvious, Thomas, just to state the obvious, so you created this huge balloon and by its color being black, it absorbs all the sun's energy and warmth and makes it significantly warmer than the outside temperature because air is enclosed. And then it follows the, the principle of a hot air balloon being hotter inside than outside without a sor another source of heating it up than the sheer sun shining on it. 
So it's literally a solar energy powered, no other energy needed means of flying. Yeah, yeah. How, how far can you fly with this? <laughs> well, we, I think so we can make many rounds around the world. And you will ask me how to do it at night, but let me go back to that because sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes people get confused when we think about like, uh, you know, is a solar balloon, people think of, okay, what is the solar panel? Or where are the batteries? Because, and, and in this case, it's directly solar radiation, as you, as you very well explained, Klaus, uh, who allows this differential of temperature and elevate a person in the air. In this case was Leticia Marquez, the only female pilot of all the Argentina country. And uh, we have been awarded now uh, 33 uh, records uh, uh, for the most sustainable flight in human history. I mean, if you go back to the time of the brother Mongol Pierre, the brother Rice, the Apollo mission, and, and for any other type of, of way of, of, of mobility, we, you know, with a lighter than air technology, we were able to, you know, to establish a, a new records for, for, uh, for human flight. This means we did uh, 33 records in every category for a female and general category. Uh, this means the more sustainable flight in, in human history. And that, that was something which, you know, had been ratified in our Federal Aeronautic uh, Aviation uh, International Community. I, I so admire that this, what you're just saying, proves that it works in the aeronautic world as much as it works in the art world, because it's such a poetic piece that the sun heats that up enough so that it can fly. Yeah. We have a couple of more slides, and in the interest of time, I would like right. to them perhaps a little faster. I did not want anybody to miss out on this incredibly beautiful Palazzo Strozzi installation here because how this reflects the um, beauty of the architecture, but also in relation, of course, to the process of viewing and finding yourself in, uh, in this space, in the exhibition. We go to the next. But these clouds, the, yeah. these, uh, the, the one before is, the, is also, I mean, and it's so beautiful because it reflects this kind of Renaissance palace. But these are the type of sculpture which will allow to fly during the night also with the energy of the sun. And you might ask how? Well, in the 70s, there was only one space agency who did it and did three times around the world. Now, there was nobody on board. What it, what it happened is kind of, uh, you know, during the day you have the sun, but what happened at night when the sun go down, you are just free floating now with the wind. Now the sculpture go down, go down until you pick up the, you know, the infrared radiation from the earth. I mean, the earth, it, it, it maintains some heat at night. These heats go back to the transparent part of the sculpture that you see in front of you and, and it maintains the float. And in but that way, uh, you know, the CNES, the French Space Agency, uh, uh, have made three times around the world. That's in incredible. Six. That's incredible. I have one more slide of this later. So here we have sounding the air and installation view at the Palo de Tokyo. If we go one slide further, once Radio Galena. You want to say <laughs> a bit what that is? <laughs> No, I mean this is uh, again like a, kind of a speculative work, but uh, but it's but it's, it functions also to that extent. It's kind of a very uh, primitive old radio. Uh, people usually who when when they're in jails is a kind of is a type of radio that you build because you don't need electricity to hear uh, signals. And I mean uh, this is a piece that uh, yeah we 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 present at Palais de Tokyo. Then was Artissima also got an award also, and and then we were playing kind of. A, 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 a podcast radio uh, from indigenous rights of South America. Uh, you know, and again, it's a radio that you could hear radio, radio signal in, in, in few places around the world uh, uh, without a need of a battery and without the need of a solar panel or, or extra energy. And just to state the obvious, what are you putting the headphones into? Uh, you, you connect it, it's kind of a stone, uh, it's a Galena stone, and you wrap it up uh, with, with, with a copper wire. And this, it, it works like a kind of a receiver. And this means with that you can hear, you put your headphones on and you can hear the, the signals of, 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 of different radios. And depend where you, you know, you have a small needle, which is, it touch some of the crystal, and depending where you, you touch, you can change the, the, the dial, of you can hear different uh, uh, radio frequencies. 
Let's go to the next slide. And, and this is also like, a, a, is, we, we have another group. This, this means we have two kind of group. One is the Irocene community and the other one is the arachnophilia. It's like a, a lot of people suffer still from uh, arachnophobia uh, and, and they're afraid of spiders and, and, and and because also the culture have built around these phobias, which are really unfounded because there is no reason uh, uh, why to be afraid of spiders. Uh, there are very, very few uh, uh, um, you know, people who have ever been affected because of the biting of a spider. This means something uh, which is it's, it's almost like a fake news, let's say, being afraid of spiders. But nevertheless, uh, there are a lot of people who suffer from that phobia. Has been we, we work together on trying to reverse that phobias and and in these cases is a is a is a, is a, is a kind of a fortune telling uh, based on a spider divination which they practice in Cameroon uh, uh, and this means you can download this application and you could ask questions to the spider and the spider will answer you through vibrations. Yeah. And you have the invertebrate rights. You did an exhibition at Gropius Bau this summer. And one of your topics that is uh, a motif that recurs is also extinction and your protection of spiders, of the invertebrate. Do you want to talk a bit about what you did in Berlin at Hopiusbau before we go into um, a final round of, uh, round of free associating? Yes. Uh, well, what, 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 you know, was... Uh, was created by Thomas Oberhaus and Tino Segal, and we were walking through the museum. And they asked me, "Okay, what what do you want to exhibit?" And I say, "Why why we don't have a look uh, if there are some spider webs in the museum, right?" And then say, "Well, you know, it's like a, usually we are broomed away." But then say, "Let let's give it a chance." And then we walk through all the the museum, different rooms, and we found this beautiful uh, orb web, uh, not this dome web. Um, it's kind of a focus, I think, so web. Uh, if I don't remind. Wrong. And this means what, what, you know, this was uh, eight months before the exhibition will open. It's been the great challenge was asking, could we ask all the security, all the manager staff and, and everyone to, to, to keep that, uh, that, that web and that spider? And, and then, you know, this was much before the pandemic and, 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 and what is happening today in the museum. And somehow we managed to, to preserve that web and this was the part of the exhibition. And then I wrote this small letter on trying to, yeah, to explain to, um, to people, uh, trying to think uh, with the spiders of, of, of the capacity to also to hopefully that this web will, 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 will be there forever and will become part of the collection of the Martin Gropius Museum. And now some, somehow they have accepted and, and it seems that we'll be there for, uh, for a very long time. And this makes me happy uh, that, uh, you know, is the idea that maybe we can start to think about, um, and also through this uh, application and this, uh, you know, that sometimes Tanya also asked me uh, uh, that people find spider webs in their own homes and say, but it's an artwork. Uh, and, and I always say, yeah, yes, of course, right? Uh, and this means it's kind of sometimes, you know, I'm happy when, when you know, when, when, you know, art could help to change the perception of the world and where we live with and with who we share the world. That's incredible. So I put together five ending slides. So if we go to the next one, that is the last but fifth slide. 2015 was a very important year. Paris Climate Summit, Grand Palais, very important artistic visualizations as expressions of the worry of climate change also. We have this here. If we go one slide further. So here you have these translucent spheres that you described at Palazzo Strozzi. But let's go back to the slide before. Would you, my question is actually, I think with all your invertebrate, spider, all these different associations and, and communities that you're building and the lithium and all of this, um, I think for me, this work also exhibited parallel to the World Climate Summit uh, is an important work because as one thread through your work is a certain activism that never loses its form. This is incredibly beautiful. 
I think this is incredibly beautiful in its monumental shape. Say a little bit about if you had to sum up your, so to say, creative artistic activism, how would you do that? Uh, I, I think it's collaboration, you know what I mean? Really going through, you know, from, from one discipline to another discipline uh, and try to, you know, weave these threads, right? Is, I think so, today, I think so, we are in a huge crisis, let's put it that way, right? There is a, an urgency that I think so, we all have to lose a little bit our comfort zone, no? Of, of being kind of a, uh, of, of knowing our own discipline. And somehow I think so, I mean, as, as you, Klaus, and, and, and many other curators, uh, and, and, you know, we, we, we try to kind of go from one field to another field and try to work together and try to find narratives and stories uh, that, that somehow it might help us to understand the world that somehow it seems uh, many of us are not perceiving, right? And, and this means it's really going through, you know, sometimes what, what you mentioned also, you know, going and do an exhibition in the middle of a Salt Lake together with indigenous communities and try to find, uh, you know, proposals of ideas or way of working together that sometimes also goes out of the, of the mayor institution of the, of the, you know, the museum. And I think so, you know, I think so, you know, if, 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 for me, that, that, that's something which I, I want to continue, you know, is try to really like um, find possibilities of, of, yeah, of working together. That's incredible. If we go one slide further and then one more, so two slides, next one. For this slide I wrote down, no, 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 go back. Sorry, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Always uh, with a time delay with technology. So that's uh, one of our beloved Buckminster Fuller domes on top of a dome, on top of a translucent membrane that you can uh, socialize on. How do you want people to feel and perceive your work? Because I think this captures so much for me uh, the wonderment because going to Dusseldorf, seeing pieces, um, Describe a little bit how, how ideally you would like people to perceive your work. Um, with all the senses, I think. So that's the first thing, you know. Sometimes we have really this hegemony of a visual culture, you know, that we have to see the things. But I think so, you know, for me, it's a, it's a great exercise of, you know, now, now you know, nowadays, uh, you know, uh, sometimes we surround ourselves from incredible technology, but sometimes we forgot also that the other living beings, which are uh, so incredibly intelligent. And, you know, for me, it was a quite a surprise now with the, with the dogs again, that the dogs are able to, to smell coronavirus, right? <laughs> it doesn't mean they might be, again, like the, you, you know what I mean? And there are a lot of uh, population, you know, sometimes when we think about indigenous population, they represent only 5% of the population of the world. And they are the one who are able to maintain 80% of the land with all the biodiversity we could find today on planet Earth. This means there is a huge discrepancy on relationship of, of sometimes uh, uh, not recognizing the, you know, or spiders being able to, you know, there are some, some population also that they were, uh, because spiders, they are very, very good uh, uh, sensitivity to tremulation. You know, I work a lot with biotremology and in other fields of biology. And it means sometimes, uh, you know, uh, there were have been tribes which uh, they were noticing ants going up to the mountain because a tsunami was coming. They would not sense a tsunami, but they knew that the ants were going up to the mountain. And so they have much more weave ecology of practice, ecology of sensing, relying not human only one to each other, but also with other species. Has been sometimes, you know, when we try to read the weather today, the only way is like, okay, let's see how is the weather forecast. When I remember still, you know, my childhood is cielo pecorelle, pioggia catinelle. When there is the clouds with the shape of a ship, the rain will come soon. Well, I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, there is all the time how we can weave that, uh, that, that connectivity somehow that sometimes, you know, uh, it feels it's falling apart, no? And then, and then there is a global warming, climate change, and, and there's a huge disruption and suffering from, from a large part of the population of the planet Earth today. The dependency is really incredible. I woke up this morning and I thought, oh, I'm really cold. And I had to check on my, my iPhone if I was correct. Is it really cold? So you don't even trust your perception anymore. Exactly. Uh, and if, somehow, Klaus, also when you, you refer to that piece, you know, is, 
your body have a weight, right? And that's what is nice, you know, when, when you are seeing here, you know, people, when they will move a little bit, the other person will move. And when the other move, you move. It's, I mean, it's really generate that spaces where you became aware that your movement produces a lot of change in others and in the environment at large, if you think. You know, this kind of idea of the butterfly effect, that the butterflies, you know, moving the wings will produce a storm in the other part of the planet. It's been, there is always this kind of, sometimes we, don't, we are not so conscious about, you know, the, 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 sometimes the way how we move and, you know, this, this, this the way of hopefully becoming more conscious is something which, you know, hopefully my artwork will, will hope to invite people to, to think about it. Yeah, what I'm very impressed, if we go to the next slide briefly, what I'm always impressed with artists is the precision and detail in finding form and the precision in detail in finding form might be defined by a certain size and a certain dimension in a way. Of course it is. But then I'm also impressed by the limitlessness of the audacity of, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> the audacity and <laughs> of dreaming big. What are we looking at? And I, I, I thought this was such a beautiful utopian <laughs> slide to end end our conversation on I love that so much. No, I mean just, just like you know, so I think so look for, for good or bad term, but sometimes when people think about oh you know cloud city, what is that? You know what I mean? First is to recognize recognize that we are all flying today on something which I would say not like but Minister Fuller said is a spaceship earth, but we could call it more like a mothership earth, right? because otherwise it's too technical and we think we know how to fix it while actually we, we are all born from somewhere, right? And I think so there is a, a great respect also on all the eco-feminist uh, uh, movement that have been in Argentina. This means the role of the female is something which I think so we have to kind of prioritize somehow. But from the other side, I mean, what you see in the image is, is, is you know, it's kind of referring a little bit about new possibilities. You know, I think so, I, I, you know, before the pandemic, I think so over, two million people at any given time are flying on aeroplanes. And every time that you cross the Atlantic, there have been some statistic that you diminish the lifespan, the lifespan of somebody else in the planet for two years, every time you cross the Atlantic. It's been the, the huge uh, you know, cost every time of certain part of the population in move. It's been, you know, many of my work is also speculating of thinking like, a, well, could we also travel and move differently, another speed, another rhythm? with the movement of the planet Earth. If you think about the speed of the Earth moving around the sun, the, uh, the sun I think it's 100,000 kilometers per hour. So I don't think so that you know, any technology will ever reach that. And we are having all together this journey around the sun, right? And it's been, you know, there are these kind of planetary movements. And it means people always ask me, like, oh, now everybody should stop flying. Well, it seems that even we don't have imagination that we could fly differently. We can, we can, we are all flying today on something, right? This I mean, is hopefully will bring us this connection, you know, at the beginning, this drop of water caught in the spider web, uh, you know, this planetary, this cosmic web, as Alexander von Humboldt also will kind of argue and try to reconnect and not separate, right? The tendency is always, you know, we're sublunar and then we forget about our beloved star. While you start to be, you know, in both worlds, then we can even fly still with the warmth of the sun. And what you also, of course, remind us when you describe it this way, if these bubbles go high up enough, perhaps they could just stand still and have the, ro the, the earth rotate by itself. And then you go down whenever you reach your destination. It's only a question of perspective. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. It's the, the, the earth move by itself and then, but you know, I mean, the, the beautiful about this app that we did with, with MIT is, uh, you know, you, you just, I mean, you can try this free to download on, on the iPhone and, and the Android. You choose a, a place, let's say I'm, I'm in Berlin, I want to go to LA. You put the, the, the departure and the destination, and then it download all 700 weather station forecasts around the world. And what it tells you is the best day that the wind will take you from one place to the other. Does it mean, Today, you know, most of our value system and economy is based on, on, okay, when I go, the faster I could arrive and the cheaper on the ticket, you know, but at a huge cost for the rest of the planet and the other 
species uh, that live on this planet. In this case, it, it's kind of more about we have to enter in another movement, right? And in another rhythm, and, and, and I think so enjoy also. I mean, it's, when you fly in this, um, in this culture, which rely only on the, and I don't know, many people maybe have flied in a hot air balloon with a burner, but it's quite, you know, the burner is so noisy. If you fly only with the sun and you, you start to float in the ocean of air, uh, and you move with the wind, it's very silent, and you don't feel the wind, you become the wind. It means something very, very different. Wow, that is a beautiful description. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Thomas. This is such an incredible conversation. Thank you.